A few weeks ago, I released a video asking the question, what the hell is going on since Western culture is embroiled in a great battle over policies, language, women's sports and spaces, education, and most importantly, children. At the front lines of this all too important battle are the notorious woke activists. Over the last few years, protests have caused massive amounts of disruption by toppling statues, shutting down speaker events, vandalizing artwork, and blocking roads and runways. Not to mention many activists are calling for violence against those that disagree with them. If you see a turf, punch him in the f***ing face! These methods of violence and disruption are clearly not helping the causes they are so forcefully fighting for. But despite that, they will not stop. But why? Let's begin with trying to understand what the hell is their problem. And I don't mean their problem with society, because they have lots and we'd be here all night. No, I mean what is their problem on a personal level that they are trying to solve by embracing the role of constantly offended activists. As I see it, just like with everyone else, this is about their search for meaning. They're looking for something to believe in, a higher calling, a vision that gives them purpose. Many people have traditionally found this in religion, in the belief in God, in their family and children, and even their community. But the traditional sources of meaning have become less and less attractive to young people in the last century for reasons too complex to explain here. So young people are more often turning away from ideas of family and religion and instead looking for meaning elsewhere. It also doesn't help that the concept of community has become quite rare in most cities, the collapse made even more rapid by COVID. So for young people today, a community, instead of being created by proximity, is being forged based on causes and similar beliefs, all virtually thanks to social media. But the very tool that's bringing these people together is also the tool that is consistently overwhelming them with catastrophic news, warning them that people are dying and the world is going to end if they don't get up from their cheeto-riddled sofas and do something about it. This is not a drill because only they can fix the world's most complex problems. Frightened, anxious, and helpless, these people have hooked into online communities, bound themselves together, and come up with the only solution that makes sense to them. Activism. In some ways, activism is an ideal solution for someone in dire search of meaning. Immediately, with very little effort, it offers the reward of causes looking to accept more people into the fold. An instant community that validates your fears, bolsters you in the desire to fix the world, and confirms that you and your voice matter. So it's no surprise that the foot soldiers of the various activist movements are so passionate, willing to sacrifice their time to stand for various causes, since the activism serves as a pseudo family, pseudo religion, and a pseudo career. Now, in order to be successful in a career, it requires commitment, hard work, self-investment, education, negotiation, and more. But to be a successful activist, all it takes is a willingness to show up and shout the enemy down. Almost makes one wonder why more people aren't activists when you add in the final and most valuable reward of joining, the great feeling of having the moral high ground. After all, they are in pursuit of noble goals like saving the planet and ending poverty and fighting for immigrants, trans rights, and movements like Black Lives Matter. The conviction that runs deep through these activists is rooted in the belief that their opponents, the people they are protesting, are despicable, controlling, and greedy, racist, bigoted, and sexist, and generally people who take joy in the misery and suffering of others. Simply put, their opposition are not human. This assessment of their opposition allows the protesters to justify relying on any means necessary to accomplish their goals. If stopping traffic during a protest results in an ambulance unable to get a woman suffering from a stroke to the hospital which leaves her permanently paralyzed, then the activists don't believe they need to see their hand in the woman's suffering. After all, they've been forced to stop traffic by the pernicious policies by their lawmakers. A woman who suffered a stroke in the car and couldn't get to hospital because the road was, was blocked. She was with her son who was helpless to help her, and she's now paralyzed down one side and can't speak. And doctors have said conclusively that had she got to hospital uninterrupted, she wouldn't be in that state now. So that was a direct result of your, of your protest. So let me ask you personally, straight away, what if that woman had been your mother? Would you still think you'd done the right thing if you put your mother into a, basically into a coma? I am finding all of this incredibly challenging, especially being in this studio and talking about it. 
But what I find myself thinking all the time is why after six weeks are journalists still focused on the what we're doing and not the why? Is it because oh, no, you you're heartless no, no, or no, no. too scared I, listen, to face the listen, truth, I, Richard? I, 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 so stopping traffic and air travel or crashing a person's wedding or disrupting a flower show or calling for physical violence against those that disagree with them all seem justified. After all, they're the ones with the moral high ground, fighting for the rights of the vulnerable. But we need to talk about the problem with activism. Like I just said, activist fervor is fueled by the belief that their opponents don't share their values, that the only reason people oppose their activism is because they want to pollute the world or, or want trans people to suffer or want black lives not to matter. When the truth is that most people disagree not on what these activist organizations want to accomplish, but how they want to accomplish it, because their suggestions often do not account for unintended consequences. A great example of this is something I discussed in the previous video. Most people want trans people to get the care they need, but we do not all agree that hormones and surgeries, some with 51% complication rates, are the way to go. Is especially when it comes to children who are not equipped to make long-term decisions. But often these concerns are wrapped up and presented by the activists as transphobic or problematic, with claims that these people don't care about the mental health of trans children. And thus, with the simple stroke of clever rebranding, any opportunity for further discussion is impossible. And the media, of course, leads this charge by creating echo chambers with polarizing one-sided reporting and manipulative algorithms. By the way, this is why I use Ground News during my research. Ground News is a news comparison platform where for every news story, I get a quick visual breakdown of the outlet covering the story, along with their political bias, how factual the source is, and which entity owns the source, because I want to know what high-level interests might be motivating the headline, as well as compare headlines to see if the outlet is trying to manipulate its readers with different wording. This way, I get a far more balanced view on the news with every side of the story. I also end up spotting my own bias and where I'm getting stuck only consuming the news that favors my perspective, which I always want to correct. Ground News also has a blind spot page for this because it shows articles that are being underreported or overreported by the left or the right. If you're looking for a better way to stay informed about current events around the world, check out Ground News. Ground News is offering 30% off its Vantage subscription. This discount is only available at ground.news slash baggage claim or by clicking the link in the description. And I really want to thank Ground News for this sponsorship because it's really great to be supported by companies that have similar goals to the channel in wanting people to see the opposing perspective, which is what activists are increasingly struggling to do. This is a real tragedy since complex issues require complex solutions, and complex solutions can only be developed through passionate discussion between diverse sides. And I don't mean diverse as in race or sexual identity, I mean diversity of thought, as well as a willingness to find common values and solutions that work across the board, and not just in ideas situations, like expecting violent male criminals not to use loopholes to feign gender dysmorphia and get sent to female prisons where they can prey on more women. And that's the benefit of discourse is that the opposing side can identify flaws and solutions that can unexpectedly create more harm. This strategy of goodwill discourse is at the heart of any free society, and it has led the development of the greatest ideas. Today, we have the luxury of believing that all people are created equal, slavery is morally wrong, and freedom of thought, speech, and religion are unalienable. But for most of the history of human civilization, these ideas were considered laughable. And even today, 50 million people are still enslaved. And many people continue to face religious, racial, sexual, and political persecution in the rest of the world. It has taken free and open discourse to bring about the implementation of the freedoms we enjoy in the West today. So why do activists struggle with this concept of discourse? Why is it their knee-jerk reaction to scream instead of discuss? I do want to add that activists are not the only people who are guilty of this. Righteous yelling is an all too common tool that many from the left and the right use as an avenue to further their belief in their own sanctimony. But right now, I just want to address this question in regards specifically 
to activists? And we have the partial answer, which is that yelling strips the other side of the opportunity to respond, as does marginalizing their state as ethical human beings, as does denigrating their ability to think and provide insightful solutions or challenges. Activists don't want a conversation. They want to engage in moral bullying. This is why when activists are challenged with facts or asked to back up their claims, they often rely on tactics like name calling, since they don't want to discuss the ideas. Because they are forced this to is, choose between heating is, and eating. People are dying, this are you is, hearing me? Because it's simply not true. The government introduced a cap on energy prices and support for families who couldn't afford energy prices. What they want is to constantly maintain the right to moral grandstanding. That those were brought in last year and they are very significant What do you mean it's ensure... not true? Have you spoken to an ordinary well, person who is suffering the cost well, of I, living crisis I don't, right now? I don't believe there's any such thing as ordinary people. I believe everybody is in their individual way quite remarkable. I think ordinary people is the most condescending way of referring to our fellow British citizens. Well, of course you don't relate to the ordinary people. You're a millionaire. And their belief in their own moral high ground is so deeply intertwined with their sense of self that any attempts to dismantle their arguments is met with severe retaliation. Because by attacking their ideas, you are attacking their very soul. Faced with such a risk to their entire identity, they fight back with all their might, using insults, righteous reprimanding, and weaponized fragility. All of our children are in trouble. You have to stop this. Are you too scared, heartless, or are you stupid, Richard? You've Do you that, not understand? You've said that five times. Do you not I'm, understand? I'm not stupid and I'm not heartless, and I don't really like being patronized in that way. It may seem like activists are on the hunt for oppositional blood, but really, they are on the run. This is perfectly encapsulated in an exchange that happened between Jordan Peterson and an audience member during a panel back in 2019. I know, what is your answer uh, to young people for some of the really big uh, uh, problems facing humanity, like the you know climate catastrophe, like economic crisis, like the precarious job market, because they just don't, like you talk all this much about uh, individual responsibility. Most of us are never gonna be able to afford uh, to have all of these assets to have responsibility over. So what is your advice beyond banal comments like clean your room? Well, fundamentally, I'm a psychologist and my experience has been that people can do a tremendous amount of good for themselves and for the people who are immediately around them by looking to their own inadequacies and their own flaws and the things that they're not doing in their lives and starting to build themselves up as more powerful individuals. And if they're capable of doing that, and then they're capable of expanding their career. And if they're capable of expanding their career and their competence, then they're capable of taking their place in the community as effective leaders. And then they're capable of making wise decisions instead of unwise decisions when it comes to making collective political decisions. I'm not suggesting in the least and have never suggested that there's no domain for social action. I'm suggesting that people who don't have their own houses in order should be very careful before they go about reorganizing the world, which happens in many ways. <laughs> Activism, aside from providing all the perks I've mentioned, provides the greatest excuse to avoid personal development and personal responsibility. And because of the nature of cause-based community, where people come together based on similar belief systems, the individual misses out on being appropriately challenged and an opportunity to look within. Whereas a community of local family, friends, and colleagues is comprised of people from different backgrounds and experiences that can provide the challenge of ideas and perspective needed for individual growth. But to be an effective activist who is willing to be at the front lines of every protest, you need to turn off the parts of your brain that can consider opposing ideas, that can look at the opposing sides of views and critically think through solutions, which is why activist groups often push their members to reject anyone who doesn't agree with them fully and cut them out of their lives, leaving them surrounded by only like-minded people, a phenomenon only further exemplified by social media. So behold, for it is complete, the perfect insulation of a perpetual activist, an unchallenged, unimpeded, and an unstoppable force marching ever on in their rage against the world.